Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime video here. The setup today is a little different again. I know the, it's like the running joke in the comments that my setup is constantly changing. Um, the setup is the same. However, we are switching back to recording the podcast and the video at the same time time if you don't know i have a podcast it's called killer instinct it's always in the description box below but that is the reasoning for why the laptop is out the mic is out all of the equipment is set up this way is because we are recording and filming at the exact same time but regardless as you guys can tell by the title of today's video today we are talking about the solved case of la Joya mccoy this is a really really twisted and disturbing case that really i think deserves more recognition because i think that there is is a very big underlying message in all of this. So I think that this case is really important to talk about. So with that being said, let's just jump right on into it today. 31-year-old LaJoya McCoy was born on July 17th, 1983 in Pasadena, California to her single mother, Summer Jackson. LaJoya was also an older sister. She had multiple younger siblings that she grew up with. Now growing up, LaJoya didn't have the most luxurious childhood by any means. She grew up in a lower class family, however, they always managed to make ends meet. And something to know about LaJoya is that she had a very, very determined and motivated personality. She was an extremely, extremely hardworking person and she just wanted to make the most out of life. She wanted to get the most that she could. She wanted to succeed in all aspects. Her family describes it as she knew exactly what she wanted and she was willing to put in whatever work was necessary in order to make her successful. Not being successful, was not an option for LaJoya. She was determined to do whatever it had to take to make herself successful. LaJoya's family has said that education was always her number one priority. She really had her priorities in order. And growing up, LaJoya lived in Pasadena, California with her family. However, when LaJoya got to be into her later teenage years, her family decided that they were going to move to Las Vegas. Now, LaJoya did not want to move to Las Vegas. She wanted to continue living in California. She wanted to go to school in California. So she decided to stay and live with her aunt Alicia and uncle David. Those were her two main family members that were also living in California while the rest of her family went off to go live in Las Vegas. Now, when LaJoya was 20 years old, her life started to change a little bit. She was in college focusing on her career goals and she also met a love interest in her life. And this man is named Jose Turner. Now, at the time that the two of them met, Jose was an aspiring actor as well as a playwriter. So he wrote scripts and the two of them started dating and things started to get pretty serious between the two of them. So much so that they ended up moving in together and they ended up having two children together as well. And their relationship definitely lasted a long time. They were on and off for about seven to eight years and they ended up breaking up in 2013. Now this breakup was actually very amicable. They ended on great terms and they were really just focusing on their children. And their main concern and main priority was being the best co-parents that they could for their kids. Now, regardless of this unexpected change in her personal life being her breakup, LaJoya did not let this stop her from from reaching her goals. She received her master's degree in college and went on to get a great job as an auditor with the LA County Public of Health. And along with that, she also opened her own clothing boutique. Now this boutique was called Joya and it was located in Monterey Park. And LaJoya was super passionate about this business. She sold cute clothes and accessories. And along with this job, LaJoya was also working on developing her own smartphone app. So she she had a lot going on. She definitely kept herself very busy with all of her different business endeavors that she was focusing with. According to LaJoya's friends, LaJoya's main goal was to ultimately be her own boss. That was her end goal. She wanted to be her own boss. That way she could spend as much time as possible with her children. So at the time of LaJoya's disappearance, she had an apartment in Monrovia and she had a co-parenting relationship with Jose. He would take the kids on certain days and then he would drop the kids back off to be with LaJoya on the 
other days. And she was working on three separate business endeavors. So LaJoya had a very, very busy life. Now, when LaJoya and Jose broke up, LaJoya was actually really excited to start this new phase in her life. She was excited to get a new sense of freedom back and she started traveling a lot. She went to Europe, she got a new group of friends, she started posting a lot on social media. When she didn't have her kids, she was going out with her friends at night. She really was living her best life, so to speak. And along with that, according to one of her good friends, Ava, Ava said that when LaJoya and Jose broke up, LaJoya had no problem in trying to find a new man in her life. As you can tell by her pictures, LaJoya is absolutely stunning and she had a fantastic personality. She was successful. She had no problem in finding a man who would want to be with her. And she was really just enjoying casually dating people. She had been in a long-term committed relationship and now she's in this new phase where she has all this freedom and she took advantage of it. And she didn't shy away from posting about it either. LaJoya was huge about posting things on social media. She was constantly posting things on Facebook and she would post a lot about the guys that she was seeing. She would post pictures with them with cute little captions with it. So she wasn't shying away or trying to keep anything too personal. Now, not long before LaJoya's disappearance, something started to change in her life and LaJoya started to feel like she was being stalked. LaJoya had started telling her friends that she believed that someone was trying to hack into her Facebook account. And along with that, she said that she felt that someone was also breaking into her home. LaJoya would tell her friends that she would leave things in certain places. And when she would come home, they would either be missing all together or they would be in a completely different place than she left it. So LaJoya definitely was aware of the fact that things were not feeling right. Something definitely felt off and she felt like someone was watching her. Now with that being said, let's move on to June 9th, 2015. Now, June 9th was the last time that anyone had seen or heard from LaJoya. On the night of June 9th, she had gone out to dinner with her friend Bernadette. They went out to dinner together. They're seen on security camera footage at the restaurant. And for all things considered, LaJoya seems to be in very good spirits. She's not acting worried. She's not acting like anything is wrong. And her friend Bernadette said that she wasn't acting like anything was wrong either. Now, the following day on June 10th, LaJoya was actually supposed to pick up her sister from the bus station. And the reason that she was doing this was because LaJoya Joya had a couple days prior called her mother and asked her mother if her sister could come out to LA and help around a little bit with the kids. With having all of these different business hats that she was wearing, as well as having two kids, LaJoya needed some help, understandably so. And so that is why she asked her mother if her sister could come out and help her for a little bit. And LaJoya's sister was more than happy to do this. So the two of them made transportation plans that her sister was going to take the bus from Vegas to LA, and then LaJoya would pick her up from the bus stop. However, when LaJoya's sister got to the bus stop about an hour later than her bus was scheduled to be there, so the bus did come in a little bit late, LaJoya was nowhere to be found. Her sister started calling her and started asking where she was. However, she wasn't getting an answer. So that's when LaJoya's sister called their mother, Summer. And Summer called LaJoya's uncle, David, asking if he had heard or seen from LaJoya because these were set plans that LaJoya had. And LaJoya was a very punctual, timely, organized person. She was always where she was supposed to be at all times. If she said she was going to be somewhere, she was going to be there. Now, at first, David and Alicia thought it was very possible that LaJoya just simply lost track of time. However, after a whole day passed and no one had heard from LaJoya still, that's when her family decided to reach out to some of her coworkers. And that is when they learned that LaJoya had actually missed several very important meetings in the last couple days, which again was completely unlike her. She was extremely business oriented, career oriented, goal oriented. She knew what it had to take. So for her to not show up to meetings was not like her character whatsoever. And this is when her family started to get really worried. Now on Friday, June 12th, 2015, LaJoya's mother, Summer, called the Monrovia Police Department to file a missing persons report for her daughter. She told the police department that she hadn't heard from LaJoya since that Tuesday, the 9th, and Summer 
also shared some information with the 911 operator at this time, and that was that in the days leading up to LaJoya's disappearance, someone had actually slashed LaJoya's tires. And when LaJoya told her mom this, she also told her that she felt like someone had been stalking her, someone had been following her and watching her. So that added a whole other element of worry in this case. And the Monrovia Police Department told Summer that they would go and do a welfare check to check in on LaJoya and make sure everything was okay. Now, when authorities arrived to LaJoya's apartment, the blinds in the apartment were completely drawn so they couldn't see into the apartment and the door was also locked. Now, at first glance, authorities thought that nothing seemed wrong here. You know, the door was locked, the blinds were shut, there wasn't a sign of a break-in, nothing that was out of the ordinary. So they actually ended up just leaving. Now, I'm unaware as to whether or not they knocked on the door. Did they try and see if LaJoya was in there? Because if they did, they would realize that she was not in there and they wouldn't have heard from her. Now, it is difficult for police when it comes to adult missing persons cases because an adult doesn't necessarily have to check in with their friends and their family every day. That's not an obligation. And if they want to go MIA for a little bit, they definitely can. So if they want to go MIA for a couple days or a couple weeks or a couple months, they have every right to do so. And that's basically what authorities thought was going on here. They thought that it was very possible that LaJoya just wanted some space. She didn't want to talk to anyone. She didn't want to be around anyone and she didn't want to see anyone. However, regardless of what the authorities thought, LaJoya's friends and family knew very different in this situation. So because of that, on Friday, June 12th, so the same day that they did the welfare check, they went back again that night just to double check. And this time they started talking with some of LaJoya's LaJoya's neighbors. Now, when they started talking to LaJoya's neighbors, they learned again that nothing seemed out of the ordinary right before LaJoya's disappearance. However, still, no one had seen or heard from LaJoya in several days. And this is when authorities decided to reach out to Jose Turner, who told police that the last time he saw LaJoya was the weekend prior when he dropped their kids off at LaJoya's house. And then he went and picked them up a couple days later per usual. And everything seemed to be completely fine. Now, authorities also got in contact with LaJoya's cell phone provider, who said that LaJoya's cell phone had been active that day on Friday, June 12th, when the missing persons report was filed. So because of that, it gave everyone a little hope that maybe LaJoya was completely fine and she just wanted some space and didn't want to talk to anyone. So because of that, her mother, Summer, decided that she was going to hold off on filing the missing persons report and wait a couple days to see if LaJoya would contact her. Now, to back this story up even more, LaJoya's sister said it wasn't super uncommon for her to kind of distance herself for a little bit. That wasn't unlike her, and her friend Ava also said that about a week prior to her disappearance, LaJoya was talking about going on somewhat of a detox retreat in Arizona, and it was one of those retreats where it was no technology allowed, so that could also be why her phone was off if she was at this retreat. However, she never told anyone that she was going to this retreat. So people at this point were just speculating and throwing out theories as to why she possibly could not have been in contact with anyone. Now, after a week went by and still no one had seen or heard from LaJoya, and she didn't reach out to any of her family members, her mother, Summer, decided to not waste any more time and she called the Monrovia Police Department back to officially file a missing persons report. At this time, the Monrovia Police Department went back to LaJoya's apartment to do a third welfare check and this time they actually went in through the window. The lead detective said he went through the window of the apartment calling out LaJoya's name. However, he did not receive any response. He then went around and unlocked the door and opened the door for his other detective partner to walk in with him. And when they walked through the apartment, at first glance, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. It seemed to be a very normal looking apartment. However, that all changed once they entered into LaJoya's bedroom. This Killer Instinct episode is brought to you by Happy Dance, premium CBD skincare from Kristen Bell. Now, whether or not you've tried CBD products before, or even if you're already a huge fan, Happy Dance is different. Actress, mom, and do-it-aller Kristen Bell co-created Happy Dance to help everyone make the soothing benefits of CBD skincare a part of their daily routine. So what does Happy Dance feel like? It's like rubbing a sense of it's going to be okay directly onto your skin. It's basically the secret door to your happy place. 
Happy Dance products are made with only the highest quality CBD and premium ingredients. If they wouldn't use it on their own mothers, they would not put it in Happy Dance. They've got a whipped CBD body butter and an ultra calming CBD back balm and a multi-purpose CBD coconut melt. The coconut melt is my personal favorite. It multitasks as a skin moisturizer, hair mask, and even a makeup remover and it literally melts right onto the skin, hence the name. I use it almost every night before I go to bed, and it smells fantastic. Right now, Killer Instinct listeners get 15% off their first Happy Dance order, but only when you go to doahappydance.com slash instinct. That's 15% off your first order of Happy Dance CBD skincare at doahappydance.com slash instinct. Okay, guys, let's talk Thrive Market. Thrive Market is an online membership-based market on a mission to make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone. Thrive Market is healthy without the hassle. You can easily shop over 70 diets and values like keto, paleo, gluten-free, vegan, non-GMO, BPA-free, and more. You skip the store and you skip the lines. Thrive Market has the best selection of high-quality, healthy, and sustainable products online. Buy thousands of wholesome food, home, and beauty products curated just for members. It truly is a one-stop shop for everything you need. Thrive Market is good for you and the planet. Orders of $49 or more are shipped for free and delivered with carbon-neutral shipping from their zero-waste warehouse. Thrive Market has two different membership options. They have their one-month membership for $9.95 a month or their 12-month membership option for $5 a month billed at $59.95. With Thrive Market, and you can enjoy guaranteed savings and member-only prices. Thrive Market members save an average of $32 on every order. I saved $37 on my first order, which basically paid for the membership itself. Join Thrive Market today and get $25 off your first order and an exclusive free gift. The only way to get this offer is by going to thrivemarket.com slash killer. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash killer and get the exclusive offer of 25% off your first order and a free gift. You can't get this offer anywhere else. Go to thrivemarket.com slash killer. Now, I'm going to be honest, up until recently, my design experience has been pretty subpar. It's been at a pretty beginner level. And that really was just because of the experience that I lacked and the time that I put in to designing. However, now that I found Canva Pro, my designs are next level. Canva Pro is an easy to use design platform that has everything you need to design like a pro. Whether you're a professional designer or just getting started, Canva Pro can help boost you and your team's productivity and creativity. It's quick, easy, and affordable to design whatever you need. No matter what you're creating and sharing, Canva Pro has everything you need in one place, including a collection of over 75 million premium photos, videos, audio, and graphics. Plus, Canva Pro comes with time-saving tools that simplify and speed up the creative process. You get all this and more in just one Canva Pro subscription. My personal favorite element of Canva Pro is the Instagram story template feature. It has helped me so much when creating aesthetically pleasing Instagram stories, and they have so many different templates to use from. Anyone can use Canva Pro, whether you guys are in school or starting your own businesses or entrepreneurs or just looking to make invitations. Canva Pro is the perfect place to explore the creative possibilities. Design like a pro with Canva Pro. Right now, you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you use my promo code. Just go to canva.me slash killer to get your free 45-day extended trial. That's C-A-N-V-A dot me slash killer canva.me slash killer. A while back, I started looking for a matching puzzle game that could give me a good challenge, something requiring more than the same basic strategy round after round. But the more I searched, the more I wondered if I would ever find what I was looking for. Then I came across Best Fiends, the mobile puzzle game that always leaves your brain feeling refreshingly challenged. 
Best Fiends is way more fun than another matching puzzle game. You know, the ones where all you do is smash candy over and over. That's not like this. In fact, it's almost too much fun. I can't stop playing it. Not that that's a problem though, because Best Fiends has literally thousands of fun puzzles to solve. I'm already on level 563 and there's still plenty more to go. With Best Fiends, there's something new to play every day and the adorable collectible characters just keep on coming. One of my favorite parts about Best Fiends is their visuals. I love the bright colors of the game and it definitely makes it visually appealing. Best Fiends was made for adults to play. However, it is a casual game with no age requirement. Also, Best Fiends is constantly updating their games, so there's always something new to explore. Maybe you're like me and have some doubts about finding a puzzle game with more to offer. My advice? Give Best Fiends a try. <laughs> Just don't blame me if you can't put it down. Download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Fun fact, did you know that most home remedies and over-the-counter acne products won't work? And even worse, they can really damage your skin? Personally, during the times that I've struggled with breakouts, I've heard some pretty terrible advice. I've been told to put toothpaste on the breakout or to even dunk my face in hot water. Neither of which work, by the way. But you know what actually does work? Prescription treatments. That's why we're excited to partner with Apostrophe. Apostrophe is a prescription skincare company that offers science-backed oral and topical medications that are clinically proven to help clear acne. Apostrophe connects you with a board-certified dermatologist who will create a personalized treatment plan that is perfectly tailored to your unique skin. Simply fill out Apostrophe's online quiz about your skin goals and medical history, snap a few selfies, and your dermatologist will create your customized treatment plan. My personal skincare goals include reducing redness and texturization of my skin. Having clear skin helps with my self-confidence, so having a solid skincare routine has been crucial for me, which is why I'm so happy I found Apostrophe. It's so nice to know that a real dermatologist is helping craft my skincare plan. Right now, if you want to try Apostrophe, Apostrophe, I have a special deal for you. Save $15 off your first visit with a board certified dermatologist at apostrophe.com slash killer when you use our code killer. To get started, go to apostrophe.com slash killer and click begin visit. Then use our code killer at sign up and you'll get $15 off your dermatology visit. That's A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash killer and use that code killer to get your dermatology visit and save $15. And we thank Apostrophe for sponsoring the podcast. When police entered into LaJoya's bedroom, they found blood on her carpet, her mattress, as well as blood spatter on the walls. Police also found that all of LaJoya's bedding had been taken off of her bed and was missing, and LaJoya was nowhere to be found. Now, finding all of the blood spatter as well as the missing bedding was obviously not a good sign for authorities. However, they were still holding out hope that LaJoya was still alive. They marked off LaJoya's apartment as a a crime scene and basically just started taking everything apart. And when they did, they noticed that her cell phone and her purse, as well as her car, which was a silver Toyota Camry, were all missing. Now, at first glance, authorities thought it was possible that LaJoya had been robbed and that the robber had taken her purse, her cell phone, and her car with them. However, when authorities started to think about that theory a little bit more, they started to realize that it didn't really make a lot of sense because if they they were to have killed LaJoya in her apartment, if this was a robbery gone wrong, they more than likely would have just left her body there. They didn't think it was very likely that a robber would have taken the time to remove LaJoya's body from her apartment. They also didn't believe that LaJoya's bed sheets would be missing. Why would they take the bed sheets? And along with that, there was no sign of forced entry. So all of those things considered basically ruled out the possibility that this was a robbery. Authorities were starting to believe that whoever was responsible for this more than likely tried to stage this as a robbery gone wrong and used LaJoya's bed sheets to carry her body out of the apartment in order to conceal her from anyone possibly seeing her on the way out. 
Authorities also noted that LaJoya's apartment did smell like bleach, which indicated to them that whoever was there tried to clean up in some way, however, wasn't fully successful in that. Now, at this point, authorities had put out a notice for LaJoya's car, and only after a couple hours of that notice being out, LaJoya's car was actually found. It was found in a residential neighborhood on West Cypress Avenue, which was about a mile away from LaJoya's apartment. The officer noticed that there had been a park ticket placed in the windshield and when he got a closer look he noticed that the windows of the car were tinted so he put his head up to the window to look inside and that is when he discovered the body of LaJoya sitting in the front passenger seat of her own car. LaJoya's body was attempted to be hidden underneath a blanket and she also had a mark around her neck indicating that there was some kind of injury there as well as she had multiple stab wounds. After an autopsy was conducted it was concluded that LaJoya was struck strangled with some sort of rope or cord, and she was stabbed in the chest multiple times. Now, once this case went from a missing persons investigation to a homicide investigation, authorities hit the ground running with possible leads. They were looking at the men that LaJoya had been casually seeing, and they also decided to go back and talk to Jose Turner, the father of LaJoya's children. Now, when it came to Jose, police started to learn pretty quickly that he was not the easiest person to accommodate with, and that went with for LaJoya and also with police because when police called him the second time while LaJoya was still a missing person, Jose told the authorities that he was not going to be answering any more questions and if they did want to talk to him, they were going to have to speak through his lawyer. Now, along with that, this is when authorities started to learn that Jose had a jealousy streak. LaJoya's family said that Jose was really jealous of LaJoya, not only because she seemed to be over the breakup more than he was, but also because she was incredibly successful. She was outliving her life and managing all of her businesses and being very, very successful. And Jose wasn't really doing the same. He was a wannabe actor and a wannabe playwright, but he wasn't really getting picked up for any movies and his plays weren't doing that great. So he definitely felt a sense of jealousy in the fact that LaJoya was a lot more successful than he was. Authorities also learned that the day after LaJoya didn't pick her sister up from the bus stop, Jose went to Alicia and David's house to drop off him and LaJoya's kids. That way LaJoya could pick them up. However, when Jose got to Alicia and David's house, he didn't ask any questions about LaJoya. He didn't ask where she was, what time she would be getting the kids, if she was okay. He really didn't seem to care and that struck as a very big red flag to LaJoya's family right away. Now in the midst of their investigation, authorities brought in one of LaJoya's guy friends into questioning. And this guy was a man named Luther Walls. And and Luther Walls and LaJoya had a little bit of a romantic connection. However, they were at this point platonic friends. Luther was interested in LaJoya as more than a friend. However, LaJoya didn't feel the same way. And so they just maintained platonic friends. Now, the reason that Luther was brought in by authorities to begin with was because he was actually the last person to text LaJoya on June 9th, right before she went missing. So naturally, authorities brought him in for questioning. And authorities quickly realized that even though he was the last person to text LaJoya, he had nothing to do with this. It was very clear to authorities very on that he was telling the truth. And he also had some very insightful information about LaJoya's life leading up to her disappearance. According to Luther, LaJoya had also told him him that she felt like she was being stalked, like someone was watching her. And along with that, LaJoya also told Luther that if anything was to ever happen to her, that Jose had something to do with it. Luther told detectives that LaJoya described her relationship with Jose as very abusive. He was extremely controlling. And along with that, LaJoya actually believed that Jose had hired a locksmith to come to her apartment while she was at work one day and make an extra key to her apartment. That way he would be able to get in and out of it. Luther also told detectives about an instance in April 2013, the year that they broke up, where LaJoya had actually ran from her apartment with Jose to her Aunt Alicia and Uncle David's house after her and Jose had gotten into a huge argument. LaJoya ran to her family's home in the middle of the night, half-dressed, and told her uncle that her and Jose got into a huge argument that resulted in Jose choking LaJoya, which she responded with hitting him back. And while he was on the ground, she made a run for it and ran out of their apartment to her family's house. And that was the final straw in their relationship. After that is when LaJoya ended up breaking up with Jose for good. But this 
showed authorities that Jose did have a violent streak. He had a jealousy streak. And those are two things that made him a very plausible suspect in this situation. So they decided to look into him even more. Shortly after Luther had this conversation with detectives, Jose actually ended up reaching out to the detectives himself and asked them if it would be okay if he could run by LaJoya's apartment and pick up some of his belongings that were his kids. So pick up his kids' belongings at LaJoya's apartment. And detectives told him that it was a crime scene, so he couldn't go there alone. However, one of the detectives, the lead detective, would meet him there. The detective took this opportunity to also ask Jose why he was not concerned with LaJoya's disappearance, if he had any questions about it, why he was so okay with not being involved in the investigation. And that is when Jose told the detectives that he just didn't want to talk about it. He had nothing to say and he wasn't up to discuss it. So after that, the detective told Jose to meet him at LaJoya's apartment at about 1.30 p.m., but this time he had a little bit of a strategy in mind. When Jose got to the apartment and was handed over all of his children's belongings, he was also handed over a warrant, and this warrant was to collect Jose's DNA. Jose was not happy about this whatsoever, and he was very thrown off by it, and he was asked again in this situation why he was not concerned with LaJoya's disappearance, and that is when he asked only one question, which was, do you have any suspects? And the detective looked directly at him and told him, you meaning that Jose was the prime suspect in LaJoya's disappearance. Now, authorities immediately submitted Jose's DNA to the lab and were waiting for results, and ultimately, they ended up getting a hit. The DNA found underneath LaJoya's fingernails, as well as in her car, did match the DNA belonging to Jose Turner. And that was all authorities needed in order to make an arrest, and they did so right on the spot. Now, when Jose was arrested, an ex-girlfriend of his came forward named Adrian, and she she shed some more light onto who Jose really was. According to her, she said that when they were in public, he was well-mannered, he was a gentleman, and was wonderful to everyone around him. However, she described that once they got home and behind closed doors, Jose was an absolute monster. Detectives said that the stories between Adrian and LaJoya were so similar that while they were talking to Adrian, they genuinely felt like they were talking to LaJoya as well. Now, when it came to the trial and the prosecution collecting evidence, against Jose, they certainly had enough to incriminate him. A solid piece of evidence that they had was a blood-soaked note that was found in LaJoya's car, and this note basically seemed to be an account of all of the things that were happening to LaJoya and the things that she was worried about. This was all written in her handwriting in a note found in her car. One of the writings on the note said, quote, I get a flat tire after he says he's in my area. And along with that, all of the items that supposedly just randomly went missing from LaJoya's apartment were found in Jose's car. And if that wasn't enough, authorities also found a green notebook in Jose's car. And this is when things get really disturbing. This notebook seemed to be just a collection of Jose's thoughts and really gave authorities an insight as to how dark and twisted Jose's mind was. He had things written on the pages like, quote, I have given enough time and I have been patient. Another said, I'm tired of being mocked. I'm tired of this girl playing games and thinking that it's okay. Another said she has no conscience as to her wrongs. Another said she herself said you're going to be the one to kill me. And probably the most unsettling was when he said I will get great pleasure in tearing her apart. Now of course Jose's defense team claimed that he was a playwriter. He was a creative. He was just writing out his thoughts and they had nothing to do with LaJoya. They had no connection with LaJoya. But no one obviously bought that. After eight hours of deliberation, the jury found Jose Turner guilty of first degree murder and he was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. Now what's upsetting about this case is not only was LaJoya's life brutally and tragically ended, it's that LaJoya knew leading up to her disappearance and leading up to her death that something was very wrong and she knew that she was in danger. When Jose's behavior started becoming more concerning, she started telling people, she started telling her closest friends and her mom that she was feeling unsafe and her family also 
also learned that only several days after her disappearance, LaJoya actually had made an appointment with a security company for them to come in and install a security system inside of her apartment, which just further indicates that LaJoya knew all along that something was going to happen and that she was in danger. Now, as for what set Jose off in this situation, we'll never really know. We'll never know what his true motive was that sparked all of this. Was the jealousy of watching LaJoya live her life freely just too much for him and he eventually snapped? Was he following LaJoya? Did he go over to her apartment trying to make advances and she rejected him? Was he waiting for her inside of her apartment when she got home that night? It's all up in the air and we probably will never know considering the fact that Jose Turner still claims that he had nothing to do with this and that he is not responsible for LaJoya's death. But that, you guys, is the case of LaJoya. I'm very, very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. You can let me know in the comments below what you think. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another video here on my YouTube channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Savannah. I make videos a couple times a week. You should subscribe and join the family. I love you guys so much, and I'll see you in a couple days with a brand new one. Bye, guys.